All right, we're, we've now moved to the second part of today's hearing, which is part B. Uh, this will cover community mental health and substance abuse, excuse me, substance use disorder services. Uh, there's no vote only calendar today. All items are up for discussion. And of course, we will be taking public comment after each agenda item. And uh, probably going to limit public comment to about a minute each after that time period if we can. And let's begin with the first item, Investment in Mental Health Wellness Act of 2013. And welcome Barbara Liebert, who is the Executive Director of CHFFA. Good morning. Where we are with the program, kind of where we've been and uh, what the next steps are. And then I'm going to touch base on your question about the community settings issue. So um, we hit the ground running in June of last year when the governor signed SB 82 into law, held multiple public forums throughout the state, information gathering, but also giving uh, a signal as to where we were headed with our emergency regulations. We also had a number of board information meetings with our health facilities financing board, uh, met with many stakeholders uh, over, a course of, over the course of many months, developed our emergency regs. We were open for business November of 2013, which means we opened up our first round of applications for the first funding round. That deadline for the counties to submit their applications for crisis residential, crisis stabilization, and mobile crisis funding was January 22nd. Those applications have been under review since then, and it was just last week when we sent out our initial letters uh, to counties that will, will not be recommended for funding in this first funding round. There were 17 counties in that pool, and I'll give you a little bit more data here. We received 33 applications from 37 counties with an impact to potentially 42 counties. And what that means is uh, several counties partnered together, which is what we were hoping to see and we're trying to promote in our regulations, and that happened. So that's why we had 37 from 33 applications. And then there was one county that didn't partner with other counties, but they warranted as part of their programs that they would offer beds and services to the surrounding counties. So that's why an impact to 42. So there are 17 counties last week that received uh, declination letters, essentially. And of those counties, there are five that will be getting approval letters because uh, these counties applied for multiple programs. And some of the programs scored very well. Others didn't, where they didn't make the minimum threshold amount. And so they will, some of them will be getting positive letters. This is the week where the counties are receiving their positive letters. So from last week's series of declinations, that marked the beginning of a five-day appeal period. So the authority is now entertaining appeals from the counties who receive notice that they are initially recommended for no funding. When we, when we send out our approval letters for this week, we may get more uh, appeals because we may be approving counties for lower than the amounts that they have requested. It is our hope to wrap up all of those appeals uh, by mid-month. We have a board meeting scheduled for April 14th for a different purpose, but uh, we will fold in any appeals of the authority-based appeals. There are two layers of appeals. The first layer is me, the executive director, and then the second layer is the nine-member board. So if we have any appeals of the appeals, uh, hopefully those will be heard April 14th but it really depends on how complex those appeals are and the time that it takes to really perform the due diligence to get those uh, appeals taken care of appropriately. So the goal is to have all of the positive recommendations, the final allocations before the board at the end of April. And uh, that means that we would be in the position for sending money out the door as early as uh, early May. If the appeals take longer, then that will extend out into the, the May time period. Once those uh, final allocations are rendered by the board, uh, we will open up a second funding round. And you may be interested to note that almost all of the funding for crisis stabilization has been fully subscribed. Almost all of the funding for mobile crisis has also been fully subscribed. There will be ample funding in all of the regions, with the exception of Los Angeles, if the board approves the recommendation for Los Angeles County, there will be no funding remaining in Los Angeles but in all of the other counties, in all of the other regions throughout the state, there will be funding remaining for crisis residential, which is great news for those counties that 
are receiving the declination letters. And it's also great because we have been moving our, uh, at a very fast pace and uh, have received some input from counties that were, were moving very quickly. And some of them simply weren't ready and couldn't get their applications ready by the November timeframe last year. And so this will give them, the second funding round will give them another bite at the apple to, to potentially get some funding. So um, we received, out of those 33 applications, 14 were for crisis residential programs, 17 were for crisis stabilization, and 25 for, were for mobile crisis. If all proceeds is currently recommended by staff, this all has to be approved by the board, Eight of those uh, crisis residential programs will be approved, nine crisis stabilization, and 14 mobile crisis. What that means in terms of big numbers is 835 new beds in the state of California for crisis residential and crisis stabilization, and 25 mobile crisis vehicles with the staffing inside the vehicles. That makes substantial headway toward the main objectives, objectives of SB 82, which was the 2,000 beds and 25 mobile crisis. Uh, if everything is approved by the board and the counties are successful in rolling out their programs, um, you, you will have 52 new uh, mobile crisis vehicles out on the streets, which is really wonderful news uh, for sadly lacking crisis services in California, as uh, the, the authority has learned. I will turn to the other issue for community-based, uh, unless you have other questions. No, please. Please go ahead. Sure. Thank you. So our criteria that we developed over the emergency regulation process focuses on four main issues. The first issue is we're scoring the counties on how well they're increasing asset access and capacity for crisis services. And within that criteria, there are a number of sub-criteria with individual points that are all designed around and scored about whether the services are community-based as opposed to more institutional in nature, setting, setting in a hospital versus setting in a residential neighborhood. And that uh, criteria is scored at 30 points, so that's 30% 30 per, 30 of the overall points, 100 points possible. The second criteria is all about the continuum of care. Counties need to take pains to describe their view of the county needs, uh, for the full spectrum of mental health delivery, not just crisis, but and where are these proposed programs that they're thinking about and envisioning fit within that continuum, and the relationships that they currently have with the full partnership that delivers mental health care in their communities, not just the providers that are delivering crisis services, but hospitals, uh, law enforcement, other mental health and maybe substance abuse providers what relationships they currently have and what relationships they're going to forge to really improve crisis delivery in California. That also has sprinkled throughout it uh, the community-based uh, component of uh, delivering care as opposed to the more institutional setting. The overall goal of SB 82 is to bring down hospital utilization for crisis delivery of care and our regulations and the scoring is designed all around that to uh, score more favorably those counties that are really making efforts to do that. That's uh, 20 points, that second criteria. So we're up to 50% of the uh, scoring criteria is really all about how the community-based nature of the services is being addressed in the application. The third component is about outcomes. And as I just mentioned, the outcomes are trying to reduce law enforcement costs, trying to reduce uh, hospital use for crisis delivery, uh, trying to reduce recidivism. And that is all about taking patients and clients out of the hospital setting, getting them into the community-based uh, provision of care where it looks like there's a more successful uh, delivery of care and outcomes. So those outcomes, though, they don't specifically mention community-based. It's all about measuring that. That's another 20 points. That brings us up to 70 out of 100 points, so that's 70%. The last piece of the scoring is 30 percent, 30 points, and this is all about the authority's job of what we're historically we've been really good at for 30 years, and that is um, measuring whether once the money goes out the door, the program's going to be made and done and done right, as opposed to uh, sending money out to the door um, into the hands where the, the program might not happen. We have an incredibly low default rate at the authority that we're proud of. 
And so those points are, are raised, are, are, are weighted heavily. That's 30% of the application. It's not about whether it's community-based. It's all about whether they're going to get the job done once the money goes out, or even before the money goes out. We have to have a high measure of confidence. I think I've given you all the data that I have. Yes. But, uh, <laughs> and I want to thank you uh, for getting this uh, program up and running so quickly and uh, getting the resources out the door. Uh, to be helpful where we want them to be helpful. And I, I want to thank you for a, a great report and great work on that. Thank you. Um, does legislative analysts have any comments? Department of Finance? Members? Yes, Senator Monty. I'd just like to echo the Chair's um, compliments. Uh, this was a vision in last year's budget work and um, I think reflected one of the big achievements in last year's budget. Um, as advanced by Senator Steinberg and both houses and supported by the governor and to see it moving as envisioned so quickly to provide this infrastructure and support in counties, particularly around crisis, mental health um, uh, treatment. Uh, just want to applaud the efforts and um, I think you are implementing what the legislature envisioned. So thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to work on this program. Thank you very much. And public comment on this item? Good morning. Kirsten Barlow with the California Mental Health Directors Association. And we actually just wanted to mention how very impressed the California counties have been with the performance. Um, efficiency, effectiveness of CHAFA in administering these grants. They've been extremely communicative, um, seeking the input of the county applicants, integrating the input they got back into the grant process, and we're very confident that the programs themselves will be more successful because of how stellar their performance has been in this. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very nice to hear, too. All right. Thank you so much for your report. It was an informational item, so we're going to move on to the next one. I'd like to welcome Andrea Jackson, Executive Director of MHSOAC, please come forward. Hello, good morning. <laughs> That's always a good thing. <laughs> well, not all that new. <laughs> I've been at the commission since January. Okay. <laughs> We welcome you. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair. We're uh, going to give you a brief overview of the commission and then uh, talk specifically about the SB 82 as it pertains to the commission. Uh, obviously, you're aware that we were created through Prop 63. Not sure if you're quite aware that's been. Who am I? Am I on now? Oh, thank you. Uh, we were created uh, through Prop 63 on the Mental Health Services Act, and it's been 10 years. I'm not sure if everyone's aware that uh, we're uh, in our 10 year, 10th year anniversary. 1% tax on incomes over a million dollars. Uh, it's uh, generated approximately a billion dollars a year for services, and we've touched, excuse me, we've touched more than a million lives uh, with this money over that time. So uh, it's, it's been a great service to, uh, to the people of California. We have uh, generated a total of $9.5 billion, and the funds are for programs in five areas. The components are the community services and supports, which includes children, transition, transition youth, or adults, and older adult systems of care, the prevention and early intervention programs, workforce education and training, both for uh, clients and for, for workers who may or may not have been clients, capital facilities and technology needs, and innovation. The primary purpose of the commission is twofold. We want to and are working to expand services to Californians in need of mental health services, and we also are working to ensure that the funds and services are accessible, A, and are being utilized in the most effective possible way, B. In addition, uh, up to 5% of those funds that are received through Prop 63 go for administrative and oversight activities. That's a little bit of a misnomer because they also um, fund uh, additional program enhancements. 
Um, for example, the triage grants under SB 32 come out of that 5%, and we'll discuss those grants uh, a little bit uh, in, in just a moment. Uh, more than 2 million adults in California, which is about 8% of the population, are affected by a severe mental illness every year. So I can't underscore uh, how important uh, these services are. Over the past couple of years, there's been significant changes uh, that impact the public mental health system and the commission specifically and the, the act. They include the elimination of the Department of Mental Health in 2012, and then the year after that, uh, the elimination of the Department of Alcohol and Drug Programs. And so it's been quite a transition since then. Uh, additionally, MHSA funds are now released directly to the counties. They don't go through us um, without, so they're without state approval, they just go go directly with the exception of the innovation programs. And this is an expedient process. Obviously, it gets the money out more quickly, but one of the downsides of that is a lack of specific information and data about exactly where those funds are being spent. And so that's been a bit of a challenge. Uh, we have a statutory mandate to develop a five-year master plan for measuring client outcomes in a community-based mental health system. And we've uh, so far invested significantly in this effort, um, 1.3 million in 13-14 and 2.1 million in 14-15. That's um, right now kind of my one, two, and three priorities is evaluation and making sure that we understand how these programs work and what the best practices are. So uh, with the shifting of the significant responsibilities for public mental health administration to the from the state to the counties and the elimination of the departments um, requires that oversight and accountability for the mental health system be carefully thought out um, to produce the best, the best results policy possible um, for not only the citizens and policymakers involved, um, but obviously for the clients. The commission is the only state entity that has as its sole responsibility the oversight of California's community mental health system. That is our charge. The commission has refocused with the funding now, funding now going directly to the counties, um, our efforts on evaluation, as I mentioned, uh, and also on drafting the statutory regulations to assist counties in, in these efforts. We also have a number of other statutory responsibilities that are set forth in the act, which includes advising the governor and the legislature, uh, ensuring the funds are spent in the most cost-effective manner, approving county innovation programs, receiving and reviewing county three-year programs and expenditure plans, their annual updates and their annual revenue and expenditure reports, and uh, adopting regulations and providing oversight for programs and expenditures for prevention, early intervention, and innovation programs. So the, a few highlights of the activities um, that further these statutory responsibilities. First, uh, prevention and early intervention program. Um, this is a first in the nation program and a national model. It's the only program that sets aside 20%, uh, and in this case, approximately $200 million of funds annually to go to counties specifically for prevention and early intervention. As we heard earlier, it costs $200,000 um, for folks who, who are at the end of the, of, of the list. And we're trying to invest monies up front to try and save some of those monies and save some of those people on the backside. Uh, in addition to that, since uh, July, uh, the Commission has approved about $18 million for county innovation programs, and these are programs that test new ways to increase access to underserved populations and increase quality of service. The Commission has recently invested $1.3 million to improve the quality of and integrity of data. Um, Submitted has been a, an ongoing challenge um, to uh, improve the quality of data submitted by counties and to uh, assist counties in better utilizing the current statewide databases so that we can all work together better to understand exactly what's going on out there. In January and again in May, uh, the commission produces a final a financial report that documents the total revenue for community mental health services received by the state and that is distributed to the counties. The commission has expanded its outreach to underserved communities by targeting and directly reaching out to these communities through forums in the local communities, 
Um, our last forum was attended by nearly 300 people in Emeryville. Those have been um, f an, a growing success for us. Um, we stumbled a little bit at the beginning, but we've learned how to do them better. And it gives the community a, a real opportunity to understand what's going on and how to access services. Uh, we're also reaching out to youth and young adults in high schools and colleges. We're engaging different ethnic communities in their native languages, um, not only in community settings, but also via um, radio and programs that are dedicated specifically to those communities. And we're implementing the five-year master plan. And obviously, uh, we just don't want these evaluations to sit on the shelf. Um, we want the results to be useful and provide value to, value to the counties, consumers, and the taxpayers. So these evaluation, all of our evaluation components are designed to develop technical assistance to support counties in designing and implementing effective and relevant evaluations. For example, one evalu evaluation focus is on innovation evaluations at the local county level. We want to ensure that clients and families receive the most effective services, and we can only do that via evaluation components. And uh, we want to identify and promote best practices. For example, evaluate local community planning process and use those results to develop a curriculum, provide training to stakeholders on how best to engage in the, in the process, and ensuring that counties, <clears throat> excuse me, counties are connected so that they can understand and learn from each other what's working best. And you've also, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to get a water. <laughs> I'm not used to being on this side. I'm used to being, you know, kind of up there quiet. Um, you've also asked us for an overview of the uh, triage grants under SB 82, and we've got that for you. Uh, under SB 82, there's $32 million that is provided annually uh, under the Act, and that comes out, as I said, from that 5% administrative fund. And in the, the funds go to hire mental health triage personnel statewide, and in addition, the counties can submit federal Medicaid reimbursement requests for up to $22 million, so we can parlay that 32 into 54 uh, if, if all goes well. The grants um, have all headed out to counties so far, I'm glad to say. Um, they, they work, we want to ensure everybody knows, in a three-year cycle. So while those contracts have all gone out, um, th this, they'll be all out this week. Are they all out already? They're all out. They're all out. Um, they will have to do new RFAs in, in three years to re-up those funds um, should they be successful and, and be heading in, uh, along appropriately. They include putting triage workers in hospital emergency rooms, in the jails, on the streets, in homeless shelters and clinics, and really anywhere else that's deemed an appropriate location to intercept crises at the earliest possible time for a client. We want to increase access to crisis stabilization services and provide an opportunity to support clients in, at the earliest possible time. And in so doing, not only reduce costs associated with expensive inpatient and emergency room care, but, you know, more importantly, I think, is to better meet the needs of the individuals with the mental health conditions um, they're facing in the least restrictive manner possible and at the earliest time possible. And there's a great deal of evidence that shows if you can intercept crises, particularly with people, young people with schizophrenia, uh, at the earliest onset, after the first or second episode, you often can turn them around. They will never say here, because doctors won't do that, but you can turn them around significantly and uh, provide an opportunity for them to have a, a, a full life. The commission received 47 grant applications and we approved 22 of those grants. It was a competitive process as designed by the legislation and was put forth in the legislation. So not all the counties that applied could receive um, funding. 34 applicants scored more than the minimum requirement of 800 points, and 13 additional applicants met the minimum requirements set forth. We approved uh, approximately $31 million in the triage grants for 2014-15. It, it, it came in a, a, an odd time in the cycle, so for five months, there was $13 million for the first five months just because of the timing of the fiscal year. 
and we're working with the Department of Finance to determine if those funds remaining from 1314 can be used to support the work of potentially two additional counties. We'll know a lot more about that post May revise, um, whether that will be possible, but we're hoping to, to push out additional funds. The triage grant agreements are with the counties and will be finalized after the uh, appropriate representative signing agreement. Some of the counties can start working with just a letter. Some need signed um, contracts with the county supervisors. So there's going to be a, a variation on when those counties uh, can get moving. Uh, the commission triage, triage staff is going to monitor all these grant dollars and, uh, and ensure that crisis services are expanded and that we set up um, a system to ensure that um, counties have technical assistance and can work with one another on best practices to ensure success. Um, we're working on a monitoring instrument right now that's being developed um, and it should be in place by July 2014. And this instrument will become a performance management tool and we'll use the results um, of the site visits um, and, and what data we can collect from performance reviews to connect counties again uh, and provide perhaps outside technical assistance if appropriate to ensure the success of these grants. And that's our overview. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very good overview and also thank you for moving this program forward quickly too and um, yeah. some great success in moving many out to where it's needed. It's great to be back home with the mental health services. Yes, great, great to have you back home too. Um, do we have any comments by a legislative analyst office, Department of Finance on either item? Any um, uh, comments from members? Senator Monning. Thank you. Um, thank you for the report and the data that you've provided. Um, I know it was a competitive process. I see no funds allocated to the Central Coast region, Santa Cruz, Monterey, San Luis Obispo counties. You said it was a three-year grant cycle. Um, when can counties that weren't successful, do they have to wait three years before there would be uh, an opportunity to apply for, for these they, grants? They do. Uh, 1718, there'll be a new RFA that goes out. Uh, and we're happy to provide technical assistance to them in the meantime and, and go over their applications with them and look at potential deficiencies. And if they were denied, there's an appeal process The appeal process has concluded, yes. It's been concluded. So Correct. these are final um, decisions and allocations. Correct. Correct. The, the contracts have all gone out. Well, I'm obviously being parochial in my advocacy for my district. Of um, course. I would be curious to know a little bit more about the criteria or, um, in working with my counties uh, where they fell short, but maybe we could take that up. Sure, we can, we can get you that information, what the criteria were and, uh, uh, and, and additional data that you would like. Thank you. Sure. Senator Walters. Hi there. I know, I know you're new to the commission, but I just had a question for you. Um, last year, you probably know that the Bureau of State of Audit, Audits reported that California yes. spent $7.4 billion in Prop 63 funds, not know, knowing where the money was spent or if it was appropriately spent. And obviously, uh, this is not acceptable. And I was wondering um, how long it will be before we have some sort of comprehensive um, updated information on, you know, basic things such as how the counties are spending the money and who are the people that are using the services? Um, I'm very familiar with the audit, thank you. Um, I think two things about the audit. One, you're right, uh, it, it does demonstrate that we don't know exactly where the money is being spent, which is unacceptable. It also indicated that there was no uh, malfeasance that they could find or any misappropriations of funds or anything like that. I just want to make sure that that's clear. Um, evaluation, like I said, is my top three priorities right now. Um, we are having challenges with data collection. We're working with uh, the Department of Finance and staff and others to try and uh, streamline how we can get some of the data and use it more readily and more efficiently than we're able to do now. It's a bit of a cumbersome system. Um, and so we're working to, to do that as quickly as possible. We've invested a great deal of money in that. Um, and our five-year master plan uh, is, a, is addressing evaluation as well. I can't give you a specific date and time, 
Um, but I can tell you it's, like I said, it's my top three priorities. Are the counties not providing the information? Is that part of the challenge? It, it's a little more complicated than that, um, which you wouldn't think it, it would be. But, um, like, for instance, we're not able to collect the data directly from the counties as a commission, or we have not been in the past, um, because of some HIPAA re requirements mm -hmm. and some logistical challenges. Um, so we've hired third parties, uh, the CSU system and, and others, uh, to collect that data. Sometimes it's a bit of a challenge to get exactly what we want in the time that we want it. Mm -hmm. um, so we're working on, on trying to uh, cure that. Um, the department has a lot of priorities. Their system has been um, a, a bit of a logistical challenge for them as well. And so we're working with them uh, as well on better data collection. Um, so it's not that the counties are uh, not responding. It's how can we provide an avenue that gets the best data possible. Okay, thanks. Do you have anything to add? 